Welcome to Profit 3 TV and today I'm very excited to be joined by leading tech journalist Monty Mumford and I'm going to ask Monty, uh, no thank you for, for coming in and, and chatting to us and my, my main question is Monty is how have you reached the pinnacle of success where you are now, how have you uh, created a, a career over all the, the dot com booms and busts that we've went through uh, to land as, as one of the foremost tech journalists uh, globally recognized uh, around the world. So if you don't mind taking us through your journey, the ups and downs, because again, uh, to be honest, we're, we're going through a bit of COVID, this COVID-19 scenario now, it's a down for many people and many businesses. And uh, I guess what I'd like to know and I'd love to understand is I'm sure over your career, you've seen many ups and downs as well. So uh, introduce yourself to the audience and um, uh, take us on the journey, please. Hello there. How are you? I mean, I've over the years I've done a number of things. I was talking, well, I was talking to a mate this morning in 1984, and I worked in a pub in Western Australia, and I have this thing called Skimpies, and I, I remember thinking, what the, f what is that? And it was a uh, two girls, you know, dressed up in certain outfits, you know. What I mean, they did that for an hour. And the second hour, uh, they were completely naked, you know, and I was leaning over nipples to pour pints. And I, I, it was only, I worked in the pub for about three months, I think. And it's things like that, that I used to think were just like stupid experiences that would never make any, I'm a writer, you know, you know what I mean? So anyway, so, 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 so jobs that I've done have, have been, I've managed betting, up, betting shops in Sink Estates in London, Shepherd's Bush and Clapham was a motorcycle dispatch rider for 12 winters, probably 15 years in all. You know, broke my knee, broke my arm, broke my nose, broke my ribs, nearly lost my left foot when it got stuck in a wheel arch when I went over a car. Um, but, but mostly a traveller. And then I went round the world in 1994 uh, with a pen, because I'm a writer, uh, and I wrote a book in 1994 to 95. I started off in Perth, or straight West Australia, and then via, oh God, I don't know, Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, Nepal, and ended up finishing, type, learning to type and using a computer for the first time at the age of 33 uh, in Berkeley University in California. It's a long story and my wife would be embarrassed, so I won't um, expand too much on that. Uh, and then I came back thinking I was going to be the greatest writer in the world. And the book was called Dust Bowls of Maturity and a third of it was shit. A third of it was confession and a third of it was pretty good actually um but then i thought well i've lived the pure life uh and i haven't really you know I, I spent all of that time on the road reading you know what i mean reading every book uh without every i used to meet people that had done degrees and hated english and books because oh, i did that book at university and it was like for fuck's sake man you know what i mean like it's just the Brothers Karen was off springs to mind by Dostoevsky. I don't know why. Um, you, you know what I mean? So it's like basically all about freedom. Uh, so I came back in 95, skinned, no money, got on a bike. Uh, and then I had a couple of pints and I got done drink driving. Just a wee bit over the limit. And I just had to make a break. So I, you know, I did my year ban, you know, the biggest change in my life. I remember saying at the time, moved down to Brighton which was kind of then going, a lot of people, I lived in North London, kind of Stoke, Newton, Islington, Hackney. And at that time, there was quite a few people making that move, do you know what I mean, to get out of the city a bit and, you know, for something else. So it was a really great time to come down to Brighton. So I then I re, retrained as a journalist. So this would have been 96. I did a, a year, part-time year course in Brighton. And then I managed to get onto a course at the London College of Printing, the LCP which was a postgraduate diploma for journalists. So it was two years work crammed into three months. And bear in mind, I didn't go to university and it was a postgraduate diploma or whatever. It wasn't a PhD or anything like that. Uh, I mean, I thought if I work really hard for three months, I'll get back five years. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm really into it, man. You know what I mean? Like, I really want to, you know. So I did that. Part of the course was that two weeks you had to uh you had to get your own internship for two weeks over like every journalist i wanted to write about football um uh, and i wanted to write for the face magazine because i thought the face was awesome they, they had a great writer there, they're called gavin hills who was an adventurer and you know it was one of the first writers about 
to see him, you know, seeing Millwall football supporters trying to kiss him, you know, all this, you know, those were great days. I'm sure you remember. If you don't, you're younger than me. Um, uh, and so it was a great result. It was a very difficult course to get on, 25 people per quarter, or per term, sorry, semester. Uh, and then I, I don't know, I, I had to report on someone in the evening as part of the course. It was a guy from uh, VNU Business Publication. It was all about computers, called Computing, a weekly print magazine. Uh, and I thought, well, do you know what? I may as well learn how to write properly uh, and be a sub-editor. If I can sub-edit this nonsense that I know nothing about, uh, I don't understand. And half these fuckers can't write properly either. They're brilliant at their subject, but they can't write. Even I know how to write, even I'm trained to, I know how to do it. So I did a year there in Soho, you know what I mean? I'd spent a lot of time driving through Soho on my motorbike and I was sitting down and I was, you know, I was getting paid. Well, I was 38, I think. I was getting 17 grand a year, you know, so money was a problem, you know, whatever. But at least I wasn't going to get knocked off my bike and I could sit down. I could have a pint at lunchtime, man. You know what I mean? It was just, I met a load of old boys there and, you know, that had been in the game for years. And so they helped me and all that stuff. So but it was very fast after that. Um, I made a few fuck ups and became the website editor down in Brighton of the local paper. We fell out after three months. Fuck them, actually. Evening Argus, Argus of Brighton, Gannett's publisher. Fuck you. Uh, I'm sorry, I was swearing quite a lot. Um, and, but then there was, a, there, was a London, there was a Brighton company called Victoria Real uh, who had just landed this contract where my ex-girlfriend used to work for to do the streaming of a TV show, which I'd never heard of before. Uh, and it was, uh, they'd landed the deal to do it. It's a big deal to try and learn how to do it. But that show was Big Brother, right? So I put that on the front page of the Argus because I knew someone there. Uh, then they said, this is, why don't you come and work for us if it hasn't worked out there? So that was quite extraordinary. I think that was, Jesus Christ, it must have been 2000 or something like that, 2001, 2000 maybe. Um, it, it was just an extraordinary, it was an extraordinary stroke of luck. One that I'd retrained at a time when the internet had just really appeared commercially. So I caught up those five years of education on the course and plus, None of these people know what the internet is. And I don't either, but I'm going to learn. And they might be stuck in their ways. I'm not. So it was, you know, I came in almost as a postgraduate. Uh, so I went to Channel 4. Uh, and as the communications manager, I think, for, for Victoria Real. And they said, uh, Channel 4, they said, so, okay, we don't want anyone leaking any news out because it was a delayed show, right? It wasn't live. Um, they were editing it, the show and all that stuff. Um, we don't want anyone in your 50, 60 person team of Brighton to, you know, to let anything out of the bag. And we, we, you're going to be responsible for that. I said, fine, no problem. I'll make, make sure. I said, what are you doing about the internet? And they literally said, well, do you want to do that? And I went, what? Yes, okay, I'll do that. So suddenly I became like, the point of contact for every journalist and everyone as the you know i wrote it was it was great it was and it just shows you how it goes to your head as well because i was 38 i think and uh the i don't know do you remember nasty nick on the yes. first of yeah. course of course so he actually did a runner to brighton after he left and i had tabloids offering me me just you know basically in my nappy uh, 25 grand. We'll give you 25 grand. Where Where is he now? You know, if you can find him, we'll, we'll personally give you 25 grand. I think it was, yeah, it's between 15 and 25. I'm tempted, to be honest, you know what I mean? But I didn't do it. Um, so anyway, so I wrote a piece for the Media Guardian about them turning the cameras when Nasty Nick was booted out mm -hmm. saying this was an infringement of the internet. Duh, 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 duh. No one at Victoria Real was happy with me because I, they, I, they wanted to write it themselves, really. And I'd usurp them a little bit. Uh, and then I'd mentioned Real Networks, which was the video player. Then uh, so it's a really long story. Uh, so anyway, so that was that. And then, I <laughs> and then I think on the Wednesday, there was a piece in the Financial Times TV critic saying, what on earth is this guy who's writing for Victoria Real 
doing writing a so-called independent piece for the Guardian. Do you know what I mean? And so I was, I was, Jesus Christ, I got myself into it. Oh my God, what have I done? Um, and then I got in touch with one of the guys who used to work at the computing and he said, don't worry, if they're talking about you, then it's better than talking about something else. Don't worry about it, ride it out. Do you know what I mean? And my head got so big, like, you know what I mean? Like just, I was not 18, I was 38. And I was coming back on the train from London to Brighton and I didn't have a ticket or whatever, you know, old habits die hard, 17 grand a year, if you know what I mean. <laughs> that was a very difficult year. Um, and uh, the <laughs> inspector came up to me and he said, uh, and I'm going, yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll pay for it, I'll pay for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, deep in, deep, probably reading about myself, you know what I mean? Uh, and then the guy said, uh, can I have your autograph, please? And I went, oh, what, did you see the piece in the Guardian? He goes, no, no, I just want you to sign a credit card <laughs> a receipt. I mean, that's how I kind of understood there and then that how kind of a little bit of fame could go to people's heads. And it was a really good lesson to me and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. So I stayed there until the end of the show. I wanted a bit more money. Uh, you know, it looked like this was a big break for me uh, and all that stuff. Went to work for an incubator in London, basically an accelerator it's in Paddington. Um, I, I, I probably am the kiss of death for most companies, basically. Uh, so, so they, so they were worth about twenty-eight mil, <coughs> and um, uh, yeah. So they were on the, the, the. I remember having my farewell drink at Victoria Real. Uh, it was a little party, and someone from the Guardian said, "Uh oh!" And they just laid off about fifteen people. The company that I was about to join, you know, because I didn't have, I had no experience of getting jobs. I was good at driving motorbikes and travelling with a rucksack, but I didn't really couldn't tell who was who really. So that died to death. Uh, then I knew a mate at the time because Cubate, that's the name, they were listed. So I was doing a lot of stuff for the stock exchange. You know what I mean? Like announcements for the fifteen companies we were looking after. So that was really interesting. You know how much a price price can change of a company because of what you write. You know what I mean when you have to announce something. So it was all very highly interesting. Uh, and a mate of mine down in Brighton said, "Why didn't come and work for us?" It was Games Company, two thousand three. Uh, I had a little boy and just been born. Who's now seventeen and next door home homeschooling. Uh, and thought, you you know what, should be in Brighton really. You know if, if you know. So, so I said, yeah, let's have a chat, chat about it. So I think I went on my honeymoon and then I started working for them when I got back. 9-11 happened when we were in Africa. So that was all a bit weird. So we came back to a different world, really. Um, and then they were called Babel Media, great company, great people, local. The money was good for Brighton. So anyway, so I worked for them and they, they were completely, again, it was like going into a new world, games, video games, testing, and video games translation or localization, as you as you would have it, you, you know, like there are things like in, vid, in video games in Germany, they're not allowed to show blood, so nothing could be red, so the blood has to be green because of the Second World War. I mean, all weird things like this, and I and I think gamers are still pretty weird, to be honest. Um, so we were testing stuff, and I learned a bit, and it was you know could kind of you know, it was. 10 minutes to get to work along the seafront as opposed to you know three hour return trip to london it's all pretty good the sun was healthy amazing um and then they had these strange devices called i don't know ipacs or something like that uh, like a mobile device so they were testing games on this tomb raider on this kind of big thing like you know like a big big monitor um and at that time i was kind of running the comms and all that stuff and uh, we had two announcements. One was that we, we were opening an outsourcing office in India. And you were guaranteed press in the games industry, pretty much. It was very small, uh, very niche. And so, you know, everyone was expecting front page news of the kind of industry trade mag Babel opens up in India. Um, and I sent out another pathetic press, press release saying Babel opens first wireless lab dedicated to games. There were only two of these devices. And the phone didn't stop ringing. Vodafone, Orange, <coughs> T-Mobile, the, the lot of them saying, "Like, listen, we 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 need, we need our games tested. Can you do that? Because no one else was doing it." So anyway, so I so I did actually a deal with Vodafone 
uh, they had a thing called Vodafone Live, and it was like every mobile game in the world where they were represented were tested by us. Do you know what I mean? It was a big deal. It was a deal, I think, that lasted way after I left the company. So I started, I was one of the early people in mobile games. Again, adaptability forced upon me, but used to, like this situation, COVID and that, you know, it's shit. But at the same time, you know what I mean? You've got to kind of wiggle. Um, so then I went up back to Soho again when someone's about three. So I was there for three years, three or four. So, yeah, so we went to school um, and worked for a, play, a company called Player X. So we were a mobile games publisher and aggregator. We didn't de develop games. This was like two years before the iPhone was launched. Um, and uh, so we were the decision maker, right? So if a game developer came to us, they come to us, came to us as a publisher and aggregator. We look at the game. Yes, no. Then we would try and sell it to Vodafone or Orange or well, the five operators and all that stuff. Uh, and so I, I remember, and we were doing things with Universal. We went to you know, Hollywood and Vegas and all this strange stuff. And I think we were the first company to take Universal content onto mobile, you know. So it was all really exciting, you know, like, and especially I'd have been skint all my life. Suddenly I'm on the lot in Hollywood. And there was, and there, but there was, but it was also a stupid business. And I remember being with one of the co-founders, Ari Honka, who was just uh, the best name in the world. Ari, hello, mate. Um, and we were near Fox, near Fox Studios or something. And we were doing, yeah, there was oh, what was that called? Amped. This company had, had, had been, been given something like five hundred million dollars to be a, an MVNO, and that's like Virgin Mobile, like you, you rent space from the operator. You have a, a virtual operator. So Amps is a virtual operator. They got this huge amount of money. And so we went to see them thinking, right, this is the new trendiest thing. So we were in there and I said, Ali, this place looks really familiar. And then the phone went off in reception. And then we realized it was the set for 24. Do you remember that, that show? And it was like, yes. this fucking nuts, man. Do you know what I mean? So we went to see these two bearded kind of, you know, Californian guys, really nice people and all that stuff, and said, uh, well, we've got the, we've got the rights for um, Knight Rider, this David Hasseltoff thing, and a few other things, similar things, uh, screen, so, you, you, know, um, you know, video, you know, TV, you know, the technology's coming. And they said, oh, well, that's great. You know, we've got the right for screensavers and for pictures. I said, well, happy days. Do you know what I mean? What, what can we do? He goes, well, we had a really successful month last week. Last month, sorry. I said, he said, yeah, we, we, we sold six. And I said, wow, that's not, what, $5 each? That's like, well, that's, not, that's not a bad start, man. That's $30,000. That's 360 grand a year. He said, no, 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 six. I mean, what, you, you're kidding me. What, six? And that's good. Six, $30. And I remember looking at it and going, this is just a joke, mate. Do you know what I mean? So, so we went to, I don't know, we got absolutely hammered, I think, this place called Barney's Beanery. Brilliant, brilliant bar. Well, pub, really, in LA, just down from the road from the Mondrian Hotel, which is like, you know, celebrity spotting place. And I said to Ali, I said, listen, mate, look, just like, look. So what we do is that we get, the, we get the developer, we pay the developer $150,000 for the game, we pay $150,000 to port it across handsets because those were the days where, you know, this one didn't fit that one. Uh, so we spent uh, about 300 grand. Then we pay someone like Universal a minimum guarantee of like a quarter of a million dollars. So before we even have the game, we spent 500 grand. And then when we have the finished game, we go to one of the only five operators. Uh, they take at least 60% of the money uh, and they don't market it. And if you're not in the not top 10, you may as well throw it. This is stupid, man. You know what I mean? Like, stupid. And then, obviously, the iPhone came along and it meant that the developers could go directly to the, to, you know, to the operator themselves, which, I, which is a good thing. You know, I'm pleased it happened. But just before that happened, there was a company in Finland called Rovio Mobile uh, and they'd sent us 50 games, right? And they were all shit, right? They were full of bugs. They weren't any good and all that stuff. 
and they were getting in trouble financially and they sent us their 51st game or 52nd game or something like that and said listen you know we're in real trouble just we'll, you know you can have majority stake in it for for a pittance and all that stuff and while we were slightly rock and roll the executive team and pretty useless really and genius at some, some, some sometimes we had a really good testing team right so there's a team that said you know what now nah, don't want it send it back to him that game as i'm sure you're about to realize yeah. was angry birds so <laughs> stupid life so it was like being all of us were like being the, the fifth beetle that turned him down you know and as an aside now i'll tell you the story a bit later um so anyway so there was that and it was like yeah this bit this business i remember being in dublin for a invited to speak at a conference about mobile games or something and this was probably a two th early 2008 and I was, I was quite a weird experience in Ireland because everyone who's serving me seems to be Irish and not non-Irish and all the building sites seem to be empty hang on what's going on you, you, it was the first kind of it was the first I knew just just I uh, don't know Maybe it might be time we do, do something else because we're not profitable. You know what I mean? We've, we've had fun. We had funding, mate. We had $6 million funding, half of which were mobile video rights for the, for the premiership, right? Not in the UK. They've been sold at a huge price. So we had, ex for three years, exclusive mobile video rights. It was like 90-second package because speeds were so slow. Uh for countries outside the uk so that like the premier league so it was like denmark finland holland norway the faroe islands and china do you know what i mean like this is how stupid this world was faroe islands and china you, you know what I mean? so i said to my wife i said listen let's go with you you know what i mean let's you love india you love the dalai lama she used to work with Tib tibetan information network uh i love india Let's go and live on the beach for a year. Fuck it. Uh, so she was very clever in thinking it was her idea after I tried to turn the tank around for six months and then she went to India for some diplomatic thing or whatever. Uh, and so we went, right? Rented the house out, went to Goa, decided to stay for a year. I was seeing my boy every day because I've been up in London. Um, swimming every day amazing group of people loads of djs you know misfits you know great was playing water polo volleyball three times a week you know part yeah you know, it's amazing and you go everywhere on a motorbike without a crash helmet i mean i had my i left my kid on the front of the motorbike sitting on the tank with no helmet i don't i mean it's stupid when you look back on it because we did say we wouldn't do that but i'm quite a good motorbike rider because you know london driving <laughs> so, anyway, so it's supposed to be for a year uh while i was away the, uh, the company looked like it was going to be uh sold but it was sold uh after being there for about seven or eight months and i got a conservatory not a mortgage when the when the company was sold so it was a bit disappointing but it'd been a great deal of fun um and then so i thought we said you know like i was doing a bit of consultancy for nokia uh, who wanted to understand about India, you know, I'd made a big noise about in the games press about going there. So there was, I wasn't short of kind of, you know, people that wanted to, I did a lot of publicity for Iron Man 2 with Universal, you know, so I wanted to get that across uh, Indian operators. Uh, and then my mate rang up and said, who had a boutique hotel in Goa and said, do you want to be in a Bollywood movie? And I said, mate, I traveled in India 20 years ago and my best friend, Warren Duck Tucker died a couple of years ago. Love you, man. Uh, and a couple of friends I was with, I'd gone somewhere in India. And people had come to the kind of hovel where we were staying, looking for Western actors. So Warren and his two girls were in a Bollywood movie. Like he was a cricketer or something, I can't remember. And he said, I said, I'd love to, mate. Do you know what I mean? Dead soldier. So it really is a long story. I did the screen test, I didn't know what I was doing, I never acted. Full bit like the experience of the train out oh, the world's a stage finally been discovered the guy thinks i'm amazing and then didn't hear anything for two months you know what i mean by which time we decided to stay another year and and then i got a call you know what i mean saying 
uh, taxi taxi driver's going to pick you up. Uh, and where we lived in the village in Goa, I mean, you couldn't, you know, there's no signs, man, you know, no numbers, no, no, no nothing. So anyway, so, so this guy picks me up. Uh, <laughs> we shared a bottle of brandy between us for the 80 kilometer journey through the night across the border into Mao Rastra. It was fantastic. We were both plastered by the time we got there. Uh, at one point, I even offered to drive. <laughs> so it's India, isn't it? You know what I mean? So I got there to this village, small village that was really lit up with floodlights and all that stuff. Everybody was up. It was like a festival because they were making this Bollywood movie here. It was like the biggest thing that had happened to them. You know what I mean? And they were big film stars in this film. Topeka Padakoni is now one of the top five um, paid actresses in the world. You know, And anyway, the, the film was about in India's only ever nominated director, uh, he, uh, for a film called Lagan, uh, so, you know, he's absolutely royalty in, in India. So all of these fantastic actors decided to do a historical film about the uprising, really pushing the point, in Srinagar, not Srinagar, uh, Chitt Chittagong, which is now in Bangladesh anyway, um, about a teacher. Uh, gets his kind of sixth form students to rebel. And if it wasn't for this serious sin, there would have been no Gandhi. It was a load of bullshit. Do you know what I mean? But I, but the guys seemed really interested in me, you know, and it was like, well, I thought, it goes, and then they, you know, in the night, 4 a.m., just put a uniform on me and all that stuff, and I stuck a moustache on, and I, what? And it was really hot, and it was like the middle of the night. Uh, yes, yeah, 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 we, we thought, because you're quite tall, you know, we might... <laughs> give you a bigger role in the movie. I said, yeah. He said, can you spare four days? I said, yeah, yeah. Because you can get the cat taxi, you know, every day, or you can stay here. Uh, <laughs> we decided to cast you as Major Johnson. And it's like, oh, come on. Do you know what Johnson means? Anyway, so, so literally within like two hours, I'm looking around a building that's been burnt out. You know, oh, my God, this is a problem. And from there, it just went nuts. The, the Bollywood scripts change every day. So no one knows what's happening. It's a way, I don't know if that was the director's style. But in the end, I did about 30 days filming. Um, I leave my troops in the battle. The guerrillas have done a runner to get to this house. I have to knock on the door. I pistol whip the woman that's there. I send my soldier upstairs. He was on holiday from Hull. Uh, and he brilliant. Dyer. He died brilliantly. So let's so say I hear the shooting upstairs. I pistol whip the women. Whole face is my face looking at the kids eating rice, decide not to kill her. Then I send uh, everybody in. They all leg it. Someone gets shot. And then three months later, we finish the scene on a Friday where I have to get climb up like no safety, climb up the back of the Portuguese tiled house walk across and then bang, shoot him dead, which I did. But I fell through. My foot went through the tiles twice, 30 foot foot, man. Dio, you're all right. Sorry about the accent, but I mean, that's how, you know, you know, come on, man, you can fucking do it, yeah? Don't worry about it. It's okay. You know, everyone wanted to get back to Mumbai. So I know it's just fantastic fun, you know. And then I started to, you know, tweet about it and I'd learned a bit about social media and, Monty goes to Bollywood and all this nonsense. Um, uh, and then I did another film where uh, where I was a Russian drug dealer in Goa. I mean, you know, <laughs> could make it up 20, 25 years ago. It's just like, what's life imitating art? <laughs> I cannot tell you how ridiculous that was. Dancing on the beach, by which time I'd learned that, you know, you had to get into every scene. You had to kind of get really close to the, the, the famous actor. So there's lots of footage of my legs dancing on Goa Beach to techno next <laughs> I didn't have my face. <laughs> but I I had quite a decent bowl in it. And then we, we did some filming in, in, in wherever it was. Uh and then I then I take exception to the big tool. I've still got his phone number actually in my in my phone. Aditya Pancholi. Uh it's basically said, what did he say? And he comes across the room because we're thinking of rebelling against him. And he throws me in an incinerator, puts his foot on my neck, and he really, I mean, dude, he didn't put his punch. It was agony, mate. And then foot on your neck, press a button, and the button basically is a piece of wire with knots in it with two tribal Indians in the background, and that every time they press this non-existent electric 
It's like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm terrified that this massive block of iron was going to come. And even that was it. Yes, my thing, I'm just about to die, yeah? You're not wriggling enough, you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Better, better, yes. Because I was terrified of the thing. So anyway, so anyway, after that, strangely enough, I flew straight to um, Ethiopia to go down to the World Cup to see England play uh, Germany in the in the World Cup 16s or whatever. And I wanted to spend some time in Ethiopia. And then I went to the source of the Nile. I was really sick. I got really sick on set. So I was really ill for a few days in Addis. Uh, and then I fell in love with Ethiopia. My mate came over, who I arranged to meet Russ. Hey, Russ. Uh, and I said, listen, mate, I've fallen in love with Ethiopia. So, Ethiopia. And I found this country called Somaliland that doesn't exist. It's in between uh, <coughs> Eritrea, um, Ethiopia, um, Puntland, it's not really a country, and Somalia. Uh, and I'm having an adventure and I'm going to hitchhike and get buses and feel like I'm traveling again you know i've been doing all weird times in india we've decided to go home i had one last adventure and i did exactly that it was outrageous and the idea was to go from berbera on the coast and then get a boat to at aden in yemen uh via the um uh gorkotcha gorkotcha islands which is basically like the Gal galapagos of arabia you know what i mean and i speak arabic all right i live in egypt for a bit so well, I won't say anything. Um, uh, so I did all that, and I went. It was just the most amazing place, you know. I like Somaliland. I wrote a piece about it for TechCrunch. It was weird, like it was amazing the time of my life. 2010, England lost four-one. Who gives a fuck? Um, but then I spoke to the captain of the boat, and he said, in kind of pidgin Arabic, he said, "Yes, I can take you." And it was not hundred dollars or whatever. But I didn't have a visa for Yemen. And if I'd been single, I think I'd have probably gone for it. You know what I mean? I'd, you know, I just, you know, but I thought maybe not. But then I couldn't get out of Somaliland because it didn't exist. I couldn't go back into Ethiopia. There's a war with Eritrea uh, that had been going on for a decade. And it's like, I'm, I'm trapped. And then my man in uh, Hagesia, the best city in the world in Somaliland, uh, said, uh, oh, it's all right. there's, a, there's a flight going to Dubai. And this was like being, I'm trying to think of like, not Port Rush, something smaller than Port Rush. Uh, like, yeah, so, but in the middle of Port Rush golf course, thinking that there's an international airport within five miles of the ninth green. No way. And it was once a week, flight came in from Mogadishu, stopped off in Berbera, and they carried on to Dubai. So no alcohol, maddest place in the world. And then suddenly six hours later in Dubai. I mean, what the... So anyway, so I'm going on, sorry mate. So came back 2010, no money, skint. Um, couldn't, we'd sold a house or away, couldn't get a mortgage, um, which was the one thing, you know, we got lucky last time when there was a crisis because we, we, we saw it out in India. Um, uh, cut long story short, start, I'd started writing in, in India for the Telegraph about India, and then I took that gig over into technology because uh, I figured that, that would be a good time to be a tech journalist. It might be like being a music journalist in the seventies; could be quite a lot of fun. Everything seemed to be free, uh, so I did that, and I started collecting titles. I started writing for Forbes every three or four times a month, you know what I mean? Right from Wired, my T-Tech Review, set up a little agency, helping companies get famous. I'm missing something really big here. I can't remember what it is. I can't remember. But anyway, uh, yeah, so that, that, so yeah, you know, we could get a house for two years because we couldn't get a mortgage, even though we had money in the bank and we'd been away. It's as if you'd been in prison. So I hate banks. Um, uh, and so in the last 10 years, it's been onwards and upwards, you know what I mean? I got the interview opportunity to interview Steve Wozniak from Apple, was uh, in front of 10,000 people in Beirut uh, in 2016, was given an opportunity, another opportunity of a lifetime, didn't fuck it up much. Um, and then just in, ended up getting invited to conferences and then it was all onwards and upwards. And then November, three days with Kim Kardashian in Armenia, 
she's half Armenian. Uh, uh, got a selfie that was worth fortunes. Um, then I became, oh yes, I became a venture partner, a VC company called 7BC at the end of 2019. Uh, and things were looking great. Like, you know what I mean? Turn upside down life. Um, and then obviously COVID came along, no conferences. So that's the third of the money gone. A lot of the consultancy work deferred. Um, uh, funds, you know, if you're a VC fund at the moment, everything's gone to bed for God knows how long. Uh, so another challenge, you know what I mean? So I've set up this thing called Block Speak, um, which is blockspeak.io, uh, which is a podcast of me talking to people in the crypto and the blockchain industries. Uh, with two amazing co-founders, uh, we've done all the work basically. Uh, so I just, well, I've been broadcasting, I've got to call this guy His Excellency this afternoon. There's a guy that uh, was part of the Aga Khan dynasty, I think, but he's a really lovely guy. And I said to him on the phone last week, he's, have you, have you, are you exposed? He goes, Monty, I live in Dubai. I've got three billion invested in Dubai. I've lost two billion already so don't tell me your stories about you losing your consultancy but we're, we're okay well, it's, well you know so you've only got a billion left then you motherfucker you know but so so that's the kind of the language and the type of conversation that we had with blocks and it's all completely by luck that we set it up it wasn't in response to covid it's a bit like being in the right wrong place at the wrong time oh, i don't know you, you know what i mean so block speak is going it's going really well we've you know got apple approval in record time and all the podcast platforms we've done a reverse seo deal which means that if you search for business podcast in about nine months time we'll be number one uh, and that's you know so something like 120 grand so in exchange for guests and all that stuff sponsorship so i've become an entrepreneur at the age of 58 you know what i mean we're 60 next year i mean what the fuck? how did you get here uh, and and felt rough for the last seven weeks. You know what I mean? I, I definitely had it. You know, I was coughing up spit for. I mean, if you, I think, I mean, it's all to be private. It might be psychosomatic, but I've never had anything like this for six weeks. I used to have a spittoon next to me. You know, just coughing up. You know, um, and apparently that is one of the. Some people react like that, a mild asthmatic. Um, and then probably about three or four days ago, um, I felt normal. Again, I could breathe. You can still hear me coughing a little bit, you know what I mean? But I'm pretty convinced that that's how it was. And so, got to get ready for a new world that's just slightly shitter than it was two months ago and try to get over that one. Uh, th thank you for taking us through you know, the history and all the ups and downs. It, just, it shows to me that you know, when you hit a wall, turn around and, and go again. And, and, and definitely with your, your story, my word, you've, you've transformed yourself many times over. Is this what's going to happen, you think, uh, with this COVID and what businesses have to do again? Well, I think it's, I mean, I think capitalism is a great big Ponzi scheme anyway, right? And it's you just, I mean, that's why there's an interest in blockchain as a technology and Bitcoin as, as, a, as a means of currency. You know what I mean? I mean, how can you have, how can you have, how can people just print money and offer future money? I mean, the whole thing just seems like a scam. And, and, and it generally goes bust every few years, you know. And it's quite interesting that on the podcast that I did recently, I was speaking to someone who knew more about this stuff than I do. He said, it's like, currencies usually last for 100 years as, as the leaders. So it's been the dollar for coming on, coming on to 100 years. Before that, it was pound sterling. Before that, it was French franc. Before that, trying to get this right, was the uh, Dutch Gilder. Before that, it was a Spanish Portuguese escudo, right? So it's about time the dollar went. Um, so these are great. What, what's happened, I think, is that we've all been shoehorned into becoming digital in the space of two weeks, right? I hate digital, even though I've made money out of it. I love going to Somaliland. I love risk. I love driving motorbikes fast. I like taking risks. I love being a stupid human. You know what I mean? I like going to the betting shop and racing. I don't gamble online or on my phone. Do you know what I mean? So I, I kind of knew something was done. 
But I wanted, I realised that my, my way of life is possibly changing. You know what I mean? As a human, about I like going to the bank. You know what I mean? You know, I like human experiences. I like I'm a co- I'm a coffee shop boy or a pub boy. You know, sit there, people watch, write, whatever. You know what I mean? So there's been a huge. Some of saying didn't see it coming. So that's not true. But you know, what I mean, I expected this process to take for years or four or five years you know what i mean ai and all that stuff not grand, grand grannies using zoom or grand parents boys men whatever using zoom this was impossible right and for something like a third of the world's population just to, to go underground you know what i mean i don't think it's quite spooky it's not like as if this is lockdown it's we're living in under a curfew you know what I mean? There's lots of people that go out during the day in social distance and probably did it from day one. I live in the countryside. And, you know, I know loads of people in London that are just being a bit cheeky and a bit naughty because that's what Londoners do. You know what I mean? Probably like from your town. Um, but nobody I was doing this at night. You know what I mean? I don't think I've been out at night at all, really. You know, it's almost... Uh, and, and then this privacy or, or health... People have opted for health over privacy. So there's a revolution going on there. And companies could benefit from this digital kind of corralling. Absolutely. But there are lots of companies that aren't, weren't ready and aren't ready. And there's lots of individuals who aren't ready. And just shows how skint people have been for the last 10 years. That in the space of a week, you know, they don't have enough money to pay the rent because of their, you know, exposed or leveraged to more than they can afford and it's not their fault and it's capitalism's fault and all that stuff you know what i mean so yeah it's just like anything else you just I, i'm used to being adaptable and i've been really lucky you know what i mean and there'll be a lot of companies such as zoom that wasn't particularly brilliant technology and uh, bought a blockchain company this week which is really interesting when it comes to that technology to fill in all of the gaps i mean i spoke to John McAfee is, the, you know, the nutter um, who I met. Uh, we get on way too well, you know what I mean? It's just slightly worries me. Um, you know, he just said that Zoom was useless. It's full of holes and all that. So, so and now it's probably, the blockchain company will probably fix it or to a certain extent. Um, so they, they're one of the companies that got lucky. There'll be other ones that are... Um, very nice, such as Amazon that will clean up because they're almost like a monopoly. Can't stand Amazon. I, I was another. I, I was offered a job at Amazon when I was at Victoria Real, but I didn't take it because I couldn't be bothered to commute to Slough from Brighton. You know, oh, you listen. The Angry Bird story was I when I went back to uh, journalism when I came back from India. Uh, I got a press trip to Helsinki, and I looked at it, and one of the companies on there was Rovio, and I thought. I was skin. My mate had died of cancer. I've broken my teeth. I was coming up to 50. And so we get to the reception at Rovio. Peter Vesterback is there. He did, well, it, we, he basically made that brand, Angry Birds. I don't think we'd have done anything near as good as a job as he had. Um, so we got to reception. There's about 10 people there. And he just goes, which one of you is Monty Mumford? Ah, you, it's you. You used to work for Play X. I said, yes, I did. He said, you know what we used to fucking call you? I said, no, because we used to call you Rovio Killer. Because you all, you, you, you failed all our games. But, Monty, we have a message for you. So, one, two, three, the whole, like, 200 people stand up in unison. And he goes, but now we are all billionaires. Now, if you if you can come back from that, mate, you can come back from anything. I swear, Brian, that was the most depressing experience of my life. Uh, sorry, in answer to your question, adapt or survive. Absolutely. If you've got if you've got companies pivoting quickly to make masks or PPE equipment, be they Ford or be the the little kind of print shop down the road, you know what I mean. People are going to have to be forced to be uh, creative. Uh, and, pe- and humans generally are creative. There's going to be loads of losers, loads of losers. Um, and I think because of 
be in the VC and getting information from those networks. I mean, this is like the mobilization of two world wars and the great you know, depression all rolled into one. And we're living in this kind of 80% of a government, you know, most of the country's being paid by the government. You know, you can get food delivered and all that. And I don't see that in a year's time. I don't see that, especially if there's a second wave. I mean, I'm, as I said to you earlier, before I came on with you, you know, did take a bit of cash out at the start, you know, just in case, you know. But there's no Canada to go to. You can't go up north. <laughs> you can't go to India for two years and become a Bollywood film star. You can't go anywhere. You can't, you can't even leave this country, which is really weird. That I could drive across England anywhere now, I think, from yesterday's announcement from that buffoon. But I can't go to Wales on the same basis or Scotland. And I think the UK ceased to exist about a year ago, about a week ago, when, when they said these measures are for England only. So these are completely weird times. And companies are spending their money on payroll, and not marketing. I think, no disrespect, but I'm sure you're going to have to adapt as well. Um, you know, why do you want to spend money on marketing when you're trying to pay the people that you love and the people you work with? You know what I mean? I mean, the government does it for a bit, and they'll probably announce something today, which is Tuesday, uh, that the furlough will last longer, and it'll be less money and less money and then the crunch will probably happen in September when everyone's back at school and everyone's got to start making money again you know what I mean and I, I'll, I'll be alright I should think you know, you know what I mean I'll probably be okay um, and, and what will happen also I think is that people will have very 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 good memories of how companies behaved in this time you know the ones that have adapted and started to sell PPP equipment the ones that have treated people well, like I said, I hate banks. You know what I mean? I easily got a three month mortgage uh, holiday. Does you know? Just I could have paid it, but just thought I might as well play the system. Yeah. Um, Amazon's another company, you know, that just practices that they do. BA, you know what they're doing, trying to change the conditions of people working for them. Richard Branson's no longer a national hero. You know what I mean? You want to get help from the government and furlough and you put all your fucking assets offshore, fuck you. You know what I mean? Fuck you and all the people that you go for drinks with. You know what I mean? So that there should hopefully there should be some falling out from that. Green companies, cycling cycle companies, they just must be having a orgasm about this. That the stuff that they've been trying to do for two decades is now policy. You know what I mean? I live in Brighton, we have a green MP, the only green MP in the country, in the country, Caroline Lucas, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm a little bit out of that voting area, but it's my town. Really. Um, and they've shut down, you know, streets in Brighton and all that stuff. So slightly long winded answer to your question, but there's going to be a few winners and a lot of losers. But I read something the other day that 20,000 Chinese people's lives have been saved because of the lack of air pollution uh, up against 5,000 alleged deaths. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I can't, I live near Gatwick, there's no, I can hear, listen man, I can hear the birds, and that's a four-way street just up the road from me, you know, I, and I really, that's not my alarm going off, that's nature going off, and I think nature has just put us into te tension for three months, you fucked my planet, don't fuck with nature, you know what I mean, you mucking around with me, this is you, because we acted like children using a kind of childish metaphor, You've acted like children, you know, go back into your house before you're allowed back into the garden again. When you come back in the garden, start behaving properly or you'll be expelled. Water comes from our taps, you know, lights come on when we turn them on at the moment. What's the problem? You know what I mean? But just we've just got to consume less. And you can, you can feel like England, I suppose, Everyone's really, there must be a stage, must have been a stage in like the middle of March when all the tanning saloon, salons were closed, where this country's probably whiter than it's ever been, you know what I mean? Before the sun came down and all that. But, the, but I just see the tanning, tanning salons as a kind of metaphor for vanity and conceit and grooming and the end of the influencer, happy days, you know what I mean? People reading more books, cogitating, reflecting, thinking 
on a personal level as well as a company level amazing let's see what happens maybe it's a better world maybe as i said before it's just the same world as before but just slightly shittier incredible Marty. i tell you I, I have enjoyed myself today already so if anyone's want, watching this uh, and wants to find out more connect with you uh, see more of your podcasts uh, and uh, find you online where, where's the best place for them to go uh, well, the podcast, we've done 10 episodes so far. Um, we're broadcasting twice a week now. It's Block Speak, and it's dot .io is I for India, O for Oscar. Blockspeak.io, and it's, we're on all social channels there. My name is Monty Munford. It's M-U-N-F-O-R-D, not like that fucking band. Um, I've got a good story about them as well, by the way. So it's Monty Mumford on Twitter, LinkedIn, and all that stuff. Uh, but I'm sorry about swearing, but it, it does get me going a little bit. So we're under curfew. We need to go out at night, look at the stars. Thank you for watching this uh, video. Hope you enjoyed the, the chat with Monty. As you can see, he's, a, he's an incredible character. Uh, make sure you check out his links below this video. Connect with him on Twitter. Check out his podcast if you like what he's talking about. And you can see that you would be educated and, and get a, a glimpse uh, into what's happening in the digital world. As ever, if you enjoyed this video, please do share it with your friends and colleagues on social media. And we'll see you in the next video. Thank you again. <laughs>